uh, we finished last time, we were doing a lot of the um, MO diagrams for the homonuclear diatomics. So today we'll do the heteronuclear diatomics and we'll put together after that uh, how uh, hybrid orbital theory kind of matches with MO theory to some extent for at least uh, explaining things like, especially organic molecules, it can help us, uh, it, putting these two together can help us to understand the bonding in, in uh, a number of molecules anyway. Um, so today we're going to look at some heteronuclear diatomics. Um, in particular, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on, uh, we'll do a couple of different ones, okay? So the, the heteronuclear diatomics, remember we're saying now two different types of atoms, right? Heteronuclear. So we're going to do a couple of MO diagrams. We'll start out, we'll do something like uh, N-O, uh, okay? We'll do something like O, F, uh, minus, uh, we'll do, actually, we'll do N, uh, yeah, we'll do, actually, we'll do, some, uh, yeah, N, O, minus, okay? And then we'll do one other, we'll do H, F. So we'll do three of these uh, MO diagrams um, in order to illustrate heteronuclear diatomic MO diagrams. Um, and so the, the main rule, if I bring up, I had a periodic table on the screen a second ago, so hopefully you can see my periodic table here. Um, what we've talked about uh, as far as doing the homonuclear diatomics is the ordering of the uh, sigma 2p and pi 2p orbitals uh, is such that the pi 2p orbitals will be lower in energy for nitrogen, carbon, boron, beryllium, lithium. Uh, when you have those N2, C2, B2, BE2, and lithium 2 um, as molecules. So you'd, you'd have the pi orbitals lower in energy, or the pi bonding orbitals lower in energy than the sigma bonding orbitals for those. And that has to do with this thing that we called uh, SP mixing. And I was a little hand wavy on it. It has to do with sort of size of the orbitals and overlap uh, without getting more into that uh, and spending more time on it. But when you get to oxygen, fluorine, neon, and any other element in the periodic table, we find that the uh, sigma orbital, right, the sigma p orbitals uh, and the pi p orbitals flip, right? So now your sigmas are lower than your pi's. Now, when it comes to uh, heteronuclear diatomics, if you have nitrogen, carbon, boron, beryllium, or lithium in that uh, uh, heteronuclear diatomic, if any of those atoms are part of that for any heteronuclear diatomic, and I'm going to limit this to period two uh, diatomics, if you have any of those in it, the pi orbitals are going to be lower. So if it has nitrogen in it, it's going to be such that those orbitals are ordered like nitrogen, right? If it has carbon, it's going to have uh, the orbitals ordered so that they're like carbon. If there's only oxygen or fluorine or say neon in it, then you would order those orbitals like oxygen or fluorine or neon. And for every other element in the periodic table, you would order it with those sigma orbitals lower uh, than the pi orbitals, okay? And so when we go to our um, uh, MO diagrams, we're gonna set these up so that we can draw in these elements. And so here's our, uh, energy axis for our MO diagram. We'll have a nitrogen atom. We'll have an oxygen atom here. I'm going to separate these out. Okay, we'll have in the middle, we'll have our N, O minus, and I'll put the negative charge on the oxygen. So here we've got our uh, two P orbitals and lower in energy, we've got our two S. Uh, nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five electrons in its valence orbitals. Oxygen, here's its 2p and its 2s. It has six, but really seven because it's an O minus. So we'll have seven electrons in its valence shell here. Okay. When we put these together, remember the 2s's overlap to give us sigma 2s and sigma star 2s. And then the P's overlap. And like we said with that rule that I just told you, if there's a nitrogen in here, right? Nitrogen, carbon, boron, then the pi's are gonna be lower, okay? And so here, we're gonna have pi 2PX 
and pi 2py, uh, followed by our sigma 2pz. And then the next orbital's energies are going to be for the pi star 2px and the pi star 2py. And then way up top, we have our sigma star 2pz. And we're going we're gonna to connect those in as well. Okay, and so then we've got now a total of five electrons from the nitrogen atom and seven electrons from the oxygen minus atom when they come together to form the molecule for a total of 12 electrons, and we just fill those in the exact same way. So again, the orbital ordering is this, uh, or the orbital filling is the same, the, the construction of the orbitals is the same. If you remember the rule that if there's a nitrogen, carbon, boron, beryllium, or lithium, it's going to have the pi orbitals lower in energy. And if there's none of those, it's going to have the sigma orbitals lower in energy. So 12 electrons to go in. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and 12. So uh, you could put together the um, the electron configuration, sigma 1s2, sigma star 1s2, uh, sigma 2p, uh, 2s2, sigma star 2s2, uh, pi 2p4, uh, sigma 2p2, and pi star 2p2. Uh, With a bond order, of well we've got two four six eight bonding electrons minus uh two three four anti-bonding electrons over two Oop, that is not working come on not that uh gives us a value a bond order of two okay um yeah and also uh we can identify there are one two unpaired electrons and so this compound is going to be paramagnetic Okay, we can do the same idea for OF minus. Only in this one, so here we're going to have our oxygen, our fluorine, our OF minus. So here uh, for the oxygen, there were two S orbitals and two P orbitals. For the fluorine, we have the 2p and 2s. And we fill in the fluorine. I'm actually going to put the minus charge on the fluorine because it's the more electronegative element. And so we've got eight electrons around the fluorine. There's eight. And six electrons, six valence electrons on the oxygen. And so when these orbitals combine, we're still getting the same type of overlap for a sigma bond between the two s orbitals and a sigma star. But when it comes to the overlap of the p orbitals, the lower energy p orbital is going to be the sigma 2pz, and the higher energy will be the pi 2px and pi. 2py. And then we go up to our um, pi star orbitals, 2px, pi star, 2py, and then way up top we have our sigma star, 2pz. And again, this goes back to the reason for this ordering is uh, where it's like this for everything other than uh, nitrogen, carbon, boron, beryllium, and lithium is because uh, those, those elements have this sp mixing. And so here we've got six electrons from the oxygen and eight from the fluorine. And so we put in those 14 electrons starting with the lowest energy. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 11, 12, 13, 14. And so we can do our electron configuration. Right, sigma 1s. 2 sigma star 1s 2 
sigma 2s, 2 sigma star 2s, 2, uh, oop, that should be, yep, sigma 2p, oop, 2p, 2 pi 2p, 4, and pi star 2p, 4. Okay, yeah. Well, there is a, a question. Yes, yeah, so, so for the other one, after sigma star 2, 2s, we have to do the same, I think, right? For NO negative. For NO minus? No. NO minus. O minus, this is the rule is, if you have an element that is nitrogen, boron, or carbon, the pi, uh, or beryllium or lithium, the pi orbitals are gonna be lower in energy than the sigma orbitals. If you don't have a carbon, a nitrogen, or uh, a boron, or a beryllium or lithium, then the sigma orbitals are gonna be lower in energy. No, 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 yes, I got that. But yeah. for, the, for the downside, when you write the uh, sigma one is two, for the other one. You so you mean for the, the electron configuration? Yes, yes, I, uh, yes. Sigma 2s, sigma star 2s. Then you're, you're doing it in order, right? So this is sigma 2p is the next one that comes in order here. Oh. Can you okay. see, yeah, see how that we build up from the bottom? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. that's, that's where that's coming from. Yeah. Uh, for the bond order on this, you'll have two, four, six, eight bonding electrons minus two, four, six, Anti-bonding electrons divided by two gives you a value of two. And there are no unpaired electrons, so this is purely a diamagnetic compound. Okay, so uh, there's, there are those ones. Now, HF is a little bit different. It's a little funkier because of the nature of having, well, the hydrogen, its uh, orbital uh, its valence orbital is the 1s orbital. And so it's not going to be the same type of an overlap here. Okay, so when you go and put together the electron uh, or the MO diagram for HF, you have to take into account, so the uh, hydrogen and the fluorine, okay, where the hydrogen is the 1s. Now that 1s electron that's in the hydrogen isn't held in as strongly as the core electrons from the fluorine. Who's got a question? Oh, did I do my math wrong? Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> uh, yes, eight minus six is two divided by two would be a one. Yes, that would be math. Math works. Um, so now my, come on, there we go. Uh, yeah, so math works here. The, the bond order should be one on that. Um, getting ahead of myself in my head and not putting it right down on the paper. Okay, so back to HF. So the 1s orbital from the HF, uh, or the, from the hydrogen in HF, is going to be um, probably higher in energy than the, the core electrons of the fluorine. Remember, the, we had these um, uh, ways that we can form a bond. One, we have to have overlap of orbitals, and then we have to share, have shared electrons. But the orbitals have to be in a similar energy. And so you can think of the 1s electrons of fluorine being way down, way off even the screen here. And the, uh, the 2s orbitals and the 2p orbitals of the fluorine as being uh, higher, uh, or it, more in the range of the energy of the orbital from the uh, hydrogen atom. And so when you set this up, what you'll notice here is, uh, so the fluorine has its seven valence electrons. The actual overlap that's gonna be the best overlap of the orbitals here is gonna be this 1s electron uh, here, right? That's in the 1s orbital, right? You can think of that one. And then the, the 2pz orbital, right? If our z is our bonding axis. And so our, really our, our bond is gonna occur between that 2p, Z orbital and the 1s orbital of the hydrogen. And so this 2s orbital for fluorine is gonna be lower in energy. It's gonna be down here, okay? And so when you have this particular bond, this is gonna stay as just a 2s orbital. It's unhybridized. And so that'll stay down there. It's not gonna interact. It should be at the same height. Um, a little hard to draw on here sometimes. Um, and then when you have uh, the 
uh, orbital ordering, one of the keys here that you're going to have is uh, the orbital that you're going to have bonding. I'm not really concerned for you to know where that comes in in whether the orbital overlap between the 1s and the 2pz orbital uh, is going to be above or below the 2s here, but you should know that it's going to be below the 1s and below the 2p orbitals, and it's going to give you a sigma bond. So you could say that's a sigma uh, h1s to f 2pz. Um, and then you're going to have a sigma star because when those overlap, right, they give you a bonding and an antibonding orbital. Uh, so the sigma star will be from the H1s to the fluorine 2pz, right? That's the kind of the key here, and we can link those in. Um, because really what we're, the thing I'm looking for you to see is, is what orbitals are actually overlapping here. I, I'm not necessarily worried about the, where those come in. But the other thing on this is there are two orbit, orbitals here, the p orbitals from the fluorine, that didn't get used. And those are just going to stay as 2p orbitals, so 2px and 2py from the fluorine itself. And so that's why we put these little dashes in here, is to show you where those electrons are coming from. Now, this molecule has a total of eight valence electrons. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this does a pretty good job of mimicking the Lewis structure. If you think about the Lewis structure as being uh, this right here, right, you can kind of look at it as, hey, there's a sigma bond here between the hydrogen and the fluorine, and there are three lone pairs of electrons on that fluorine atom. And so, well, there, that would be the 2s electrons there, and then the 2px and the 2py are just sitting there on that fluorine atom. And so this, this kind of shows you how uh, the Lewis structures uh, kind of mesh, sometimes they mesh relatively well with the, uh, the MO diagrams. Uh, not always, but uh, they, they tend to, to mesh somewhat well. Um, if you're doing uh, the, M, or, so I'm not going to make you worry about uh, the, um, sig, uh, the electron configuration of something like an HF. I'm not particularly worried, but you should still be able to do the bond order here. And remember the bond order is the number of bonding electrons. So we're talking about bonding electrons, right? So we only have two bonding electrons, right? Uh, minus, there are zero anti-bonding electrons, right? The sigma star orbitals, that would be two minus zero over two should be one. And so um, I'm gonna change my color here so I can illustrate this. The electrons up here, and here are non-bonding electrons, right? They're not actually involved in any bond. Right, those are all non-bonding electrons. So those aren't included in the uh, bond order calculation. That's, that's something I wanted you to see to illustrate that here. And sometimes that's gonna be the case. And how do you know they're non-bonding? Well, you don't have a sigma or a pi to uh, illustrate uh, the type of, of bond there because they're, they're not bonding. They're connected directly to the fluorine and not connected to the hydrogen at all. That's why we would need those uh, lines that we've used in the past, okay? And so that's heteronuclear diatomic molecules. So uh, section, or so, oh, yeah, Maya. Yes, um, so question about, uh, yeah, that one you just did. So if we don't see dashed lines or connections, would we uh, consider that non-bonding? Uh, no, so that you're still connecting the lines, right? You can still see I've got the little dashed lines here, right? Oh, it's like a straight line, but right, it's but not it's like not, the it's, connecting to the hydrogen, got it. Right, yeah. And, and the other thing about that, you'll notice that anytime you have orbitals that are non-bonding, they're gonna come at the same energy as they were in the, the uh, uh, lone atom by itself. Okay, so if we see energies at the same, quote, level, then that's a good right. indication of non-bonding. Yeah, because because you're not getting the stabilization from bonding and the destabilization from anti-bonding. Got it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so when we, we can now sort of combine these um, uh, to a certain extent, okay? Um, and 
the way this works is it's a little complicated, sort of a, a little bit beyond your pay grade yet, but it's something that we need to introduce now. So when you see it, if you go into an organic chemistry class, you, you're not uh, totally um, out of the loop here. Okay, and that's combining sort of localized electron and molecular orbital theory. We've kind of done a little bit of this when we were identifying the types of bonds back when we were doing Lewis structures. Um, and, and, you know, drawing out structures and showing the orbital pictures. So if you look at a benzene molecule, and a benzene molecule is just C6H6, the, there are two, uh, a couple of orbital pictures to look at in a benzene molecule, but a benzene molecule uh, has this, a Lewis structure that looks like this. and it has resonance, right? So you could draw the Lewis structure of benzene also like this. Where those double bonds are just, all three of those double bonds are just shifted uh, around the the ring of carbon atoms, right? And so this particular molecule has uh, all of the carbon atoms are uh, sp2 hybridized. And so when we look at the orbital picture here, we can consider each of those uh, carbon atoms to be bonded in a uh, trigonal planar electron geometry. It turns out uh, each of these, since each of them is let me try this a uh, different color on here for each of the, the atoms. So since each of these carbons is come on, trigonal planar, try to draw these in here. You can imagine having, if they're all trigonal planar, this whole molecule is going to be planar. And so what you wind up having here is you get overlap of the sp2 hybrid orbitals from one carbon with the sp2 hybrid orbital from another carbon all the way around that ring to form our sigma bond. So these are all the sigma bonds, right? So this is the sigma bonding, as they, we call it in this little figure, the sigma bonding framework in the benzene molecule. It shows all of the sigma bonds, right? Those are the bonds that have orbital uh, uh, overlap and electron density localized between the two uh, bonded atoms, okay? But what we don't have pictured is essentially the, um, the p orbitals, right? The p orbitals are perpendicular uh, at each of the carbons, and it's the, the unhybridized p orbital that remains. And what happens with those is those particular uh, orbitals are going to overlap to give you a bunch of different molecular orbitals. And those molecular orbitals are sort of what are seen here, where you have the, uh, they, these are all pi molecular orbitals. So this would be the, you can consider this to be the pi uh, molecular orbitals. of benzene. And the way to look at this is, well, you can have these orbitals overlap such that they're all in phase, or you could have them overlap such that you get one uh, node, a uh, nodal plane in between uh, the two lobes of the orbitals, right? One nodal plane in between how those pi orbitals overlapping. Or you can get two nodal planes in two ways, or you can get three nodal planes in one way, and the three nodal planes in, in one way uh, is uh, where those, um, uh, the p orbital phases are alternating uh, you know, plus minuses around on each of the neighboring carbons. And the most stable, the, the most bonding, if you will, is the one that's uh, down in the bottom. The second most stable, the next most stable will be the ones where they are, uh, you only have one node, then, then where you have two nodes, and then where you have three nodes. And so essentially what you're using here is you're understanding that the carbons in the ring 
are bonded to each other in sigma bonds using that hybrid orbital theory where those carbons are sp2 hybridized. And then the, the, the p orbitals themselves can overlap uh, in either all in phase or uh, various uh, uh, iterations of the phases being alternating. Uh, for each of the different possible molecular orbitals. And this is showing to some degree the relative hierarchy uh, on the energy diagram of all of those p orbitals that could be used in bonding. So that's sort of where this comes from. Um, and benzene is a really good example of it. The benzene molecule uh, is interesting because where those uh, p electrons are all in phase, right, where they're all one phase above the carbon, carbons, uh, the, the six carbon plane, or they're all the other phase below this, where those six carbons are bonded, right? Even though those are two lobes of the same orbital. Uh, that means that the electrons, because all those orbitals are in the same phase, the or electrons can sort of move around that ring uh, of electron density freely, uh, which means those electrons are considered to be what are called delocalized, right? They're not stuck in between bonds, those electrons are delocalized over all six atoms, right, in this pi uh, bonding system, okay? And so really that sort of puts together the uh, hybrid orbital theory along with uh, MO theory, okay? Now there's one other thing I, wanna, I want you guys to see because I think it's important for us to have this in our toolbox is a different type of writing a chemical formula, okay? Uh, so we've done things like we've done molecular formulas. We've done structural formulas. Right, we've done Lewis structures. And in particular, I want us to take these Lewis structures and be able to sort of add to the Lewis structures. Okay, so Lewis structures can be pretty tedious, right? If you wanted to draw a molecule like, let's say C4H10, for a pretty good sized Lewis structure, you could write that out with four carbons that are attached in a chain. But you can see this is kind of tedious to do, right? Having to draw in all 10 hydrogens, and this gets worse when you have more and more uh, atoms. And this is, I think, important for you, especially those of you who only need to take Chem 101. Uh, we want to learn a new way of drawing these structures that's a little bit faster, a little bit easier. It's actually something you'll see more often in uh, all over the place when you see anything like a chemical structure. It's a line angle formula. The line angle formula represents the carbon atoms at vertices and ends of line segments. So we're not actually going to write each carbon atom symbol. Okay, we assume that they're there. Okay, the other thing we're gonna do is with the hydrogen atoms, we're not always gonna represent hydrogen atoms either. Instead, we're gonna have enough hydrogen atoms uh, bonded to the carbon atoms such that each carbon atom is bonded to uh, three other atoms, okay? And so this molecule here in a line angle formula would be represented like so. So the carbon atoms, so that, right, there's a carbon atom on the end of a line segment. That carbon, that's a carbon there. That's a C bonded to three hydrogens. Okay, that's bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two hydrogens. Right, that's what that one is. So anytime you have a vertex, right, uh, you have a carbon that's bonded to some other amount of hydrogens bonded to a carbon that's bonded to a certain other number of hydrogens. Okay, this one is, right, that's what that is right there, right? And then the last one is another carbon bonded to three other hydrogens. And so the whole idea of this is it's just a lot easier to draw out a chemical structure 
because you don't have to write in all the atoms and bonds in between them. You're basically saying at each end of a line segment, each vertex, you've got a carbon atom. And the number of hydrogens that are bonded to that are just assumed to be until that carbon atom has a total of four bonds. So if you look at something like benzene, so here's the Lewis structure of benzene. Again, right? So there's one of the two um, resonance structures of benzene that we have. Um, that drawing that out in all those lines is a little bit uh, annoying, but you can also depict benzene using line angle formula. And here, now you've got double bonds between carbons. And so what we're showing is the ring, right? Each, let's say this carbon here is depicted right there. Right, it's bonded to one hydrogen and two carbons, and the two carbons that it's bonded to, one of those two carbons is double bonded. And so you'll start to see this more and more, and you'll start to see it, if you go into 102, we'll spend more time with it, you'll use this a lot more. But I want you to be able to identify molecules based on these line angle formulas. It'll be something you'll see all over the place, okay? Um, and so I think that's important because depicting uh, molecules via this motif, if I want to identify uh, the types of uh, bonds there, right, that shows me that's a double bond, right? That's a CC double bond. Okay, and so we should be able to say, oh, if there's a CC double bond, then that's a sigma bond. There's a sigma bond there and there's a pi bond there, right? The sigma bond, well, the carbons are both sp2 hybridized, so there's a carbon sp2 two orbital that overlaps with a carbon sp2 orbital. And for the pi bond, you've got a carbon 2p orbital. You can say 2px or 2py or 2pz, as long as it's the same as the p orbital that's bonding to the next carbon. So if I said 2px, this next one needs to be a 2px also. Okay, so this is another way or place that we're gonna wanna make sure that we can um, identify um, the types of bonds is if you start to see um, this line angle formula uh, in chemical structures moving forward. And I think your textbook does this a bit as well. Um, and the textbook doesn't always tell you why, what it's doing there, but I want you to make sure that we covered that before we go any farther. Okay. So with that in mind, um, that's really all we're covering for today. Um, and so you basically have your lab to do. Um, it's the, the last labster lab of the term, right? It is due before the exam, so make sure you finish it before the exam on Thursday. So hopefully I'll finish it this week. Um, and I will stop our recording there.